Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a special episode of Shizzle Gaming Reviews. This is Shizzle Network here. Today we're going to be doing a retrospective video of the Microsoft Xbox, as 2021 will not only mark the 20 year anniversary of the original Xbox, but the 20th anniversary of the Xbox brand as a whole. And I won't be doing this alone because joining me are two fellow YouTubers known as the Retro Raiders. We have Nightbound92 and Uwata Cube. How are you guys doing today? Well, talk, talk advice on, uh, <laughs> on, on uh, Retro Raiders. But yes, I am here and I am proud to be finally, with all of the homies, doing a uh, big video, doing a huge collab video like this. Everybody's here. Hey guys, I'm I'm New Auto Cube. Uh, I'm Dark Vice's partner with uh, the Retro Raiders. It's such a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, thanks for inviting us, Larry. This yeah, is the first time anytime, on, guys. Anytime. This is the first time you've been on Larry's I'm very show. honored. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a huge honor to have two YouTubers who are making a name for themselves join me on what I think is one of the most important game consoles of all time. But before we uh, dive into that topic, first I want to discuss uh, the history. Like, first off, I want to know exactly what y'all history is of the uh, Microsoft Xbox when it first came out, and we'll start with you, Dark Vice. Okay, so for me, uh, as you know, for, if any of you watched the Dreamcast video, which I know you, Larry, have watched our video on Dreamcast. Yes, it's my favorite you one. Would know, you would know that the Dreamcast was like the first system that I was actually like super hyped for. And how sad I was after the system discontinued. Oh yes, it hurt everyone. So, one thing that, at least from my perspective, looking at the Xbox, my older brother was the owner of the Dreamcast originally, and he was excited for the Xbox, and one thing he pointed out to me before the system even launched, is he called me over the computer and I sat with him, and he was like, notice anything familiar about these games? And I was like, I've heard of some of them, and he's like, a lot of these games are sequel sequels to games that were on Dreamcast. Like Dead or Alive 3. As I have right here. Was a sequel to Dead or Alive 2 copy. which first launched on the Sega Dreamcast. Wow. That is correct. I actually have Dead or Alive 2 right here. Hey, there we go. I got one. So, I got mine too. And it wasn't just this game. Uh, Austin has Sega GT 2001. No, I don't. On the oh oh, oh are you are you talking about for Dreamcast or yeah Xbox? Dreamcast. Oh yeah yeah. Dreamcast. I don't have it with me at my desk here, but yes, I do have a copy of it. Yes. So another example of a sequel of the of a Dreamcast game coming to the Xbox, and of course one of my favorite games on, that was one of my favorite games on Dreamcast. Jet Set Radio. Future. And, of course, Capcom vs. SNK 2. Nice. Capcom vs. SNK is definitely one of the greatest uh, fighting games ever made. And, hands down. You know, it wasn't just the Dreamcast that uh, had sequels uh, from that era. It was also the Sega Saturn with the Parents of Dragon Moon series. That is true. Over. So, for me, someone who is a huge Sega fan, at the time, was super excited for the Xbox. We were, because to me, it was the next evolution of the Dreamcast. Yeah, that's what it, it, it did feel like that. If we look at the controller, which you guys have your controllers on you right now. If you look yep. at the controller, look at the top. Notice how it has two memory card spots on yep. the top. Yep, it's very, very similar to the VMU. An evolution of the of the Dreamcast controller. Look at the color yep. scheme of the buttons. A lot of them. And by any coincidence, the, both the Dreamcast and the Xbox were both yeah. powered by Windows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna er, mention that, and also just like the overall like feel of the controller. It feels like a, a Dreamcast controller. It just like as for the S controller. Unfortunately, I, I don't know I, what to do. Unfortunately, but, I have a third-party S controller, so I'm not gonna show that right now. But, uh, no. The, also, the Duke controller. The first time I saw the Duke controller, I was... The audacity that Xbox had to release that juggernaut <laughs> controller. <laughs> Look, that D-pad was terrible. 
Yeah, I actually have the Duke controller. It's not on me right now, but it is a oh, yeah. pretty awkward uh, controller. It was, think. A, it was a combo of some controller, but can we talk about the aesthetic of the console itself? Okay. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There were like th there were like several designs because like I remember, like I think it was at an electronics show. It was in the year two thousand. It was one year before it was officially released. It had like a completely different design. It was like it was like this gigantic S. Yeah, had like the yep. hardware like yep, in the circle the right there. And then, like, about a year later, yeah. they kind of went with a more simpler yeah. design by yeah. having, like, this gigantic black case, almost like, almost like, a, giant, almost almost like a giant computer, which essentially so, that's what it is. Looking at the console itself, we can see that a lot of the designs are kind of similar to the Dreamcast. It's a very, very heavy much. console. They definitely took the same thing. When I saw this, I saw a display unit of this at the Toys R Us before the system launched. They actually had an LED inside the Xbox logo. Oh, that's oh, so cool. that, yeah, that's awesome. It lit up, and I was like, "Is that what it's actually gonna do?" And my brother was like, "Nah, it's not actually gonna do that." I was like, "Dang it!" Because <laughs> that would have been <laughs> awesome. Imagine it's being so in a dark dope. room and just having that uh, light up. But you, you could always mod it. <laughs> yeah, and people mod it all the time, and they sell it through eBay. So that's great. It's a very moddable system. Compared to the Dreamcast, obviously. The GameCube in the PS2, which were its uh, competition, this system is just massive. Oh, it oh, yeah. is. It's a beast of a system. It's like the PS5 of that regeneration of a system. It, it was. It was. It was pretty huge. It was heavy, but man, was it powerful. Like, out of all the systems that were around during that time, the Xbox was uh, technologically the most powerful because of how uh, the hardware side of it was built off of the Windows hardware, which made it better for it to uh, graphically, like, render textures and such. Like, you, you yeah. know what I mean? Because with the PlayStation 2, a lot of the uh, hardware was, I guess you could say, it was like first party, it was developed in-house by uh, Sony. I mean, they still kind of use some uh, hardware, but with the uh, Microsoft Xbox, on the other hand, they... They literally, they wanted the whole system to be centered around Windows because they were partnering with DirectX yep. at the time, and they uh, developed softwares for Windows to allow uh, Windows XP, which was out at the time, to play all kinds of PC games. Yeah. And the thing with the system is because of its, it basically used a modified version of DirectX, which was the operating system for this particular console. Because of that, it could run games. Uh, DirectX was, if I recall, the biggest like the most developed for as far as gaming for Microsoft at the time for Windows. So to have that, it made games much like the Dreamcast easier to port PC games. It made the, it uh, easier for any developers to put it, uh, to mm -hmm. port their games to the Xbox. It was very, pretty much like import friendly, well, you know what I mean? I wouldn't necessarily say that because if we look at the, uh, if we look at uh, the Xbox, some of the games, even though it's the most powerful system, does not don't always run the best on this console. The majority of the time, the games would run the best and look the best on the Xbox. But let's take a game like let's take a lot of the Sonic titles. At the time, those games were ran best on GameCube. Yes, I have. Yes, they did. So, while it is true that this was the strongest system of that generation. It didn't always mean that you were going to get the best looking games in some cases, but for the most part, you were always going to get the better looking versions and the better playing versions. Yep. That's true. One of the oh, few no, games, Xbox. another example, I can think of games that look great but don't always perform the best would be Time Splitter's Future Perfect, which is one of my favorite first person shooter games ever made. I've always wanted to try it. Yeah, it's a very, the thing is, is that it's a very great game, and even though it was ported to all three of the platforms at the time, the GameCube and the PS2 and the Xbox, the one thing that uh, the PS2 version had over the Xbox version was widescreen, not to mention the uh, the frame rate of the game ran better, but the Xbox version had more, had a higher resolution because it was able to support 480p at the time, and at the time, 480p was the highest resolution that you could go. Right. So, when we look at the hardware, it was a very powerful piece of hardware. Sega gave it a lot of support and a lot of companies gave it support. Much like with the PlayStation 1 at the time, uh, they were able to secure a lot of different companies to work with this. And let's and going into the games that I got to experience, the lifespan that I have now on the Xbox, 
uh, one, me and Larry have already brought up, Dead or Alive 3. Which, in my personal opinion, is one of the best fighting games ever made, and the best one of the series, because... And because this was a launch title, right? It was, at the time, this was a game that had, like, the best graphics possible, because the creator of the series, Tamanobu Adagaki, uh, says as one of his video game philosophies that he prefers to develop and make his games and publish them to the most powerful uh, hardware that would be around in that time period. So at the time, since Microsoft didn't have any uh, deals, any exclusive deals with any game company, uh, they decided to partner up with uh, Tecmo for Dead or Alive 3 because they wanted to use Dead or Alive 3 as a way of showcasing the power of the Xbox, and thus it became one of its launch titles. And Tecmo, for the most part, ended up, and Team Ninja ended up specifically developing games for the Xbox on that. During that generation, you didn't see a lot of other Tecmo games in our consoles at the time. Weren't they the companies who uh, mastered the uh, boot physics? Yes. That is right. correct. That is correct. <laughs> um, but yeah, but you're right though. Um, and this would lead to this would lead to at least four Dead or Alive games being released for the Microsoft Xbox. It's not only Dead or Alive 3, but we also saw the release of Dead or Alive Ultimate, and we also saw uh, Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball, which as absurd as the game is, uh, realistically speaking, this at the time was probably the best looking Dead or Alive game on the Xbox because it was able to not only, uh, I guess, imp somewhat improve the graphics from Dead or Alive 3, but to also like improve the physics. And the reason I bring this particular game up is because for Dead or Alive Ultimate, more specifically Dead or Alive 2 Ultimate, they use the exact same uh, graphical engine as uh, Extreme Beach Volleyball while also retaining the same gameplay fundamentals from Dead or Alive 3, which is precisely why the Dead or Alive Ultimate Collection is highly praised on top of re-releasing the original Dead or Alive, which was a direct uh, port from the Sega Saturn version, but improves huh. the visuals. So that's why I think Dead or Alive Ultimate will also be one of the most important pieces to the original Xbox because Dead or Alive showcases how powerful the Xbox was at the time. This was actually my first uh, experience playing the Xbox. Huh. I never knew because that. I, because I had played the demo of uh, Dead or Alive 2 on the Dreamcast. This was instantly the game that was the most recognizable that my brother got at the time because the games he got at the time were Halo Combat Evolved and this game right here. Speaking of which, speaking of which, Halo Combat Evolved was another one of the launch titles that was released right next to Dead or Alive 3. And at the time, even and this is a funny, this is actually a really funny story, is that um when Halo was first announced, it was like in the 90s, it was during the Xbox's development, and Bungie Studios at that time were an independent game developer, but then Microsoft uh, bought it out. Originally, Halo was going to be a third-person shooter game, but when Microsoft got it, they instead transitioned it to a first-person shooter game, and believe it or not, to some of the casual fans out there who don't know, there was a time where people actually heavily criticized Halo for being a first-person shooter game because the first reveals were, they were mostly mixed, but most of them kind of complained about how it just like changed the whole core element of what Halo was originally going to be. But when the game actually launched, it ended up becoming the best-selling Xbox game at the time, completely overshadowing all its other launch titles. And now, Halo Combat Evolve is regarded as one of the greatest and most important video games ever made. Huh. Interesting. So, obviously, one of the games that I was the most excited for to come out, and the next game that I played on the Xbox, was uh, Jet Set Radio Future. Now, this game is not technically a sequel, more of a remake of the original Jet Set Radio on the Dreamcast. Which confused me at the time because I assumed it was a sequel. But, you would uh, think so, because it says future after Jet Set Radio. <laughs> this game basically improved on every single aspect of the original Jet Grand Radio. The original Jet Grand Radio, that game has not aged well, if you play it today. But this game has aged almost perfectly. Because all of the things that were clunky about the original Jet Grand Radio have been perfectly refined or replaced with something more efficient in this game. So... 
playing this for the first time, I was a bit confused because I was like, okay, why am I building up the team again? We, the team's already been established in the first game. But, uh, yeah, I didn't realize until later that it was actually a remake. What a great remake. Uh, it's a game that I can go back and play once in a while, and I never... I don't have the same issues with the control as I do with the Dreamcast version. I love the Dreamcast version, and I love the music in the Dreamcast version, but this just has way better music. It remixed some of the original tracks. It has tracks licensed from actual artists. It was, a, uh, you know, it was just incredible. And I think if you're going to have an original Xbox, it's got to be one of the games that you have to own. If you don't own this game, uh, there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get that from my... Don't worry, I'll work, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> one of the games that also stuck out to me... Uh, I was a big fan of Soul Calibur. We discussed this in the original Dreamcast video that me and Austin did. Uh, one of the best looking games on that console. So it made sense that Soul Calibur 2 would also be one of the big show pieces as far as fighting games on the console. Hey, we all have it. We all and have if it. I'm not mistaken, this might... Was this the only Namco fighting game? Like, serious fighting game that came on the Such Xbox? Such a good game. Uh, yeah, I believe, it, I believe it was the only one that was on the Xbox at the time, since they were and mostly doing it for PlayStation. This was actually the first version... Really? ...of Star Wars 2 I got to experience. Oh, I thought you, I thought you were gonna say it's the first version that ever came out. No, well, all three versions came out at the same time. Gotcha. But was... uh, yeah, having played this for the first time, let me tell you, just incredible experience. Because I had been playing Soul Blade. Because I had played, uh, I had watched my brothers play Soul Calibur on the Dreamcast, but I hadn't really played that. Soul Blade was really the game that I played, invested a lot of time in. So when I first played this, well, when I first played Soul Blade, I saw that Baldo was in it and Taki were in there. And I was like, wait a second, weren't these characters in Soul Calibur? And then I was like, oh, this must have been a prequel game. But I wasn't entirely sure yet. So when I played Soul Calibur 2, that pretty much, you know, sig signified yes. I was correct in my assumption that Soul Blade was the very first title, then Soul Calibur, then Soul, uh, Soul Calibur 2. Uh, and I had been a huge... Had any of you known... Did any of you know who Spawn was before you played Soul Calibur 2? Nope. If I'm being completely honest with you, I didn't either. See, growing up in the 90s, I had the chance to watch the Spawn movie that had come out in the 90s. It's a ter terrible, terrible movie. But... When I saw... But at the time, I thought it was the most cool... I thought it was the coolest movie I've ever seen. And uh, Namco had actually produced Spawn Armageddon. For the Xbox, as well as other platforms, but you know, Spawn because of that, because of that release on the Xbox in particular, it made the most sense to have, to have him yeah. as a character. In a, as a guest character. And fun fact: in all three versions, uh, Neckwit, the character of Neckwit, was actually created by the creator of Spawn, Todd, Todd McFarlane himself. Another first every time. I Oh, I'm sorry. That's no, fine. Um, another first about Soul Calibur 2 is uh, it also happens to be one of the few Xbox games to support 720p, which, uh, considering that this game came out in 2003, at the time, that was the highest resolution that you could go. And considering that it could be accomplished using uh, not so much as composite videos, but usually, uh, I believe it was like SCAR cables, I believe, or SVO. I might be wrong. Make sure you guys correct me if I'm wrong. But if you had any of those at the time, the game would actually appear very, very high res. Mm. Interesting. I never knew that. Uh, I was going to say, uh, every time I think of Spawn, I think of uh, the angry video game nerds uh, Spawn episode that he made. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know why. It just does. Another, another game, and this is going to make both, and you both played this game. And I'm pretty sure I've introduced you both to this game, technically speaking. Uh, CBS 2. The first time I saw this game and got to experience it was on the Xbox. Oh, okay. Oh, huh. That I actually nice. didn't know because the the first version that I played was the uh, the Dreamcast version. Yep. Sean, what version did I play first? 
you played the PS2 version. The PS2 version first? Yeah. Gotcha. Because I have a physical copy of the PS2 version of CBS2. Yeah, I have. And the sad thing is, the version that my brother had bought at GameStop at the time, unfortunately, had a glitch. The Xbox had a glitch instead of the game, which made it impossible to play after a certain point. Oh, that sucks. Oh, that's sometimes, we, look, sometimes it would just shut off and we'd have to do it. And we'd have to restart the game or, you know, it'd be a crapshoot. But this game, I remember seeing it for the first time and thinking, is this Marvel vs. Capcom 2? <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was, uh, this was actually the first time I was introduced to SNK as well. Huh. Oh, the world of SNK. Yeah. That's one hell of a start if I have to be honest with you right now. And I think, oh yeah. But yeah, when I first played, when I first actually got a chance to play this game, it was pretty cool. I sucked, but it was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that much better at it either. <laughs> well, you know, I had seen this game in advertisements, like uh, like uh, uh, store flyers and stuff like that. And I've seen this game before, and I was like, "What is this game?" Because what I was like, "What is this in okay. And why is there a second one? I wasn't aware that the first one I didn't even come back. <laughs> <laughs> but when I had, pro- but seeing this game for the first time, I was like, yo, this is pretty great. This is pretty awesome. And uh, this was also the only North American version of the game to support online play. Huh. That is true. That because is true. Even, because even though in Japan, the PS2 and the Dreamcast version supported online play, the Xbox version did not. I mean, the North American version of CBS2 on PlayStation 2 did not. This was the only version that supported it online. And I think that's also something we need to discuss. It's just how integral the Xbox was to the online gaming movement on, as far as consoles are concerned. Because even though, you know, there had been peripherals that existed for Sega Genesis and uh, Super Nintendo to play online, and then of course you had the Sega Net, which was, um, <laughs> uh, no, not so. Larry, do you remember what the uh, online adapter for the Saturn was called? I actually, to be honest with you, I don't, but I do know that they were trying to do something with it as a way of kind of, uh, kind of feeding off from the, uh, somewhat, uh, successfulness of the Sega channel for the Genesis, given that at the time, like, downloading games and demos and stuff was a big deal at the time, since it was new, but I know for the Saturn, it really oh, wasn't. The net, the net link adapter. Is what the it was net link, that's what it was. Yeah. Yes, it was the, the net, net link. link adapter. Unlike the Sega Channel, the Sega Channel you could download games, but you could not play games online with other people. But with that the uh, Sega Net Link, that was like the really first time that you could really, uh, on an official peripheral, on an official service, play online games with other people. Some of the games that supported it were the Tona Net uh, Link Edition, Halo. Virtual On supported it. Oh wait, you're talking about your Sega, right? Yeah. Gotcha. And, um, you know, I, 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 Duke Nukem was also a game that supported uh, Netlink edition. Uh, oh, Netlink I, didn't know, I didn't know Duke Nukem supported the Netlink. And then of course we had the Dreamcast with Sega Net, and that did not go so well because the Dreamcast only lasted a few years. But from that, and from Microsoft working with Sega on that, uh, the Microsoft was, if you wanted to play online games, during the era of the Xbox, Dreamcast, PS2, and GameCube, the Xbox was really your one stop, the one place you would go to play them. Because even though uh, the PS2 had potential at launch to play online games, and we would na- later get the network adapter with the hard drive, um, the Xbox had those things out of the box. The only issue I had with the Xbox, which I thought was a bit crappy at the time, was the fact that the Xbox did not support DVD playback out of the box. You had to buy the remote to play it. Yeah, that is that's correct. the one that is downfall correct. about it. I think that's a missed opportunity considering that the, gym, that the uh, PS2 was optional. Yeah, with the PS2, it was a built-in, it was a built-in component. You, all you had to do was just throw in DVDs and regardless if you had a remote or a controller, you could still watch it regardless. Yeah. yeah. So I thought it was a missed opportunity on Xbox's part. Also, but the fact that the X, 
one more thing that I gotta say about the Xbox, the machine itself that I love is the fact that you don't have to buy memory cards for the right away. Yes, that is correct. It was one of the, I, I believe it was the first video game console to entirely focus on using uh, a hard disk drive to save or even download games or add-ons for games that you have, which yeah. I know they went up to about, I think, 8 gigs, I believe. Yeah, but before that, you know, there was external bat watch batteries in the systems, like the Dreamcast and the Sega Saturn. And unfortunately, with those systems, is that they die after a while, but a hard drive was a lot more robust, so you didn't have to worry about losing your data. Well, right God forbid as if it got corrupted. As the machine would age, obviously, uh, the hard drive would slowly start to deteriorate, but at the time, you didn't really have to worry about buying memory cards. Memory What's cards were just really a way as being a worthy hard. alternative. Yeah. And uh, the last game that I have that I really remember seeing, or that stuck out in my mind, was Ninja Gaiden. Ninja Gaiden Black. I got the other version. I remember watching my brother play this for the first time when I was younger, and just thinking to myself, yo. Oh yeah, look. Had up on Xbox 360. Yep, I remember watching this the first, uh, watching my brother playing this the first time I was like, yeah, that game's pretty hardcore. <laughs> I've never seen Sean rage so hard at a video game until you played that game. <laughs> I, I I actually thought he was gonna break his controller. Yeah, I I was, this <laughs> game, this game is infinitely harder than the version that's awesome. It beats the shit out of you and and then kicks you when you're down. Yep, and then with Austin, that version's actually much easier. I got the. Wii I actually Junior heard. Version. I actually heard that both of them are actually kind of different. Yeah, the, the, basically people were complaining originally that uh, basically to get the black difficulty of this game, you had to uh, download it. Really? On the original version to get that difficulty. Huh. Because, because some people were complaining that it wasn't difficult enough. So they actually made it into an update for the game? Yeah, and then when they released... Uh, Ninja Gaiden Black, you couldn't go back to the normal difficulty. You had to play Sucks. on the hardest difficulty that they released for the game. They so basically, they were selling people a Dark Souls, essentially. Remember when, I, remember when we were playing this and we were trying to figure out why it was so difficult and people were like, it's basically on, we let that list of the hardest games that you could play, this outbeat Dark Souls on difficulty. It's so stupid hard. Like, I think you or let me, like, try the or level you got stuck on. I, oh, man. It's just, ugh. It's hell. But I, but, I event, but I eventually played smarter, and I was able to get actually past that and levels past. Right. But After this, you, like, died, like, a thousand times. <laughs> yeah, but this game is, uh, this game will kick your ass in. Make you come back for more. <laughs> Might make you want to buy more uh, controllers after that. The first Ninja Gaiden game I actually beat was Ninja Gaiden 2 Sigma. Yes, I've never played that. As far as... I've never played it. I do know that despite how uh, how hard the uh, the remake on the Xbox on the original Xbox is is regarded as one of the greatest uh, remake slash reboots ever made because of how faithful it is and they even and what I liked about it too is that uh, they they integrated it into the universe of Dead or Alive since both games are made by Tecmo and sometimes you would have the the Dead or Alive mainstays Kasumi and Ayane appearing in very prominent roles in Ninja Gaiden and even... An, an, an interesting thing is this technically acts as a prequel to the original Ninja Gaiden series. Huh. Because oh, cool. Ryu basically says, oh, the dragon sword is my dad's sword, technically, and he's never satisfied with the amount of power that he actually has. Whereas, huh. whereas in, the, in the original NES, look, I'm not going to say spoiler alert because that game's how many years old? Look, y'all. <laughs> like 30 yeah, years old. <laughs> but, um, this game, uh, had. I think you could actually unlock the original Ninja Gaiden. Once you finish the sun. Uh, yes! On that? No, you could unlock the original arcade version. 
Oh, the original guys... arcade. Oh my god. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, does the original support that? I don't know. That's actually a good uh, question. Whether or not the original version of Ninja Guy in 2004 actually supports the arcade. I would have to look that up. Because I can't... It doesn't say anything on the yeah. box. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Is like, with uh, Panty Dragoon or Orta, my brothers had that, so I remember playing that game as well. Seeing that game as well. And you could actually unlock the original Panty Dragoon Saturn version. That is so cool. I never knew that. So it's kind of like Virtual Fighter 4 Evolution, where you could play the original, basically the original graphics, Virtual Fighter 1, or Virtual Fighter 4 characters. Huh. I actually didn't even I actually didn't even know that to be honest with you because like even though I don't even though I don't have evolution uh, I have played it before but I didn't know you could do that that's really awesome yeah so um, some of the other games that I would end up playing that I don't currently have is that Fusion Frenzy it's the great party game um, I remember watching my brother play a ten of Shenmue in the original Xbox. I gotta play through the Shenmue games eventually. And, uh, the Dungeons & Dragons game that came on to Xbox. That was Ooh. extreme. Hunter, also Hunter the Reckoning, which is a great multiplayer game. Um, we played, a uh, Crazy Taxi 3. That's right, there was a third one on the Xbox. On the, on the Xbox. Oh, I didn't know there was a third Crazy Taxi, because, like, I keep thinking Crazy Taxi 2 is the last one, because... It like I stayed everywhere, you know, for for Dreamcast and uh, the other system that came out on. Uh, I remember my brother is playing uh, Blood Omen Two for the Xbox. Mhm. Mm That's part of the Legacy of Kane series. Yep, Legacy of Kane. Um. I used to play the old ones on the on the original PS One. Uh, like I said, my brother is obviously like the Halo games, so they played Halo One and Two. The Xbox knows were really big multiplayer games. Time Splitters, they played a lot of that too. Uh, SSX Tricky, great game, <laughs> great. Oh SSX yeah, that's a fun game. I played it before. And uh, the last game I want to say that I really like, experienced first on that original Xbox. Oh, NBA Streets, Volume One. Huh. That's one of those sports games where you don't have to be so much into the sport to really enjoy it because it's almost like it's almost like the NBA it's almost like the modern day NBA jam. It's like you pop it in and play it and it's like yep. you know, it's so over the top that it does it doesn't feel like a realistic simulator like the uh, like the NBA like the EA NBA series. Yeah. But those games are the ones that like really stuck out to me and there was no Xbox. Uh, Austin, you wanna talk about some of your games that really you got to experience on Xbox? Yeah, do you want me to talk about like my history about Xbox a yes. bit real quick? So yeah. yeah, um growing up I knew about the Xbox and stuff, but like I never really got into like Xbox or PlayStation stuff till I like, got a bit older. Um it's around like two thousand seven, two thousand eight, my cousin um was dating a pretty or shitty of a person boyfriend and uh they or broke up and she moved out and uh, he didn't want his Xbox anymore so she was like hey uh, does Austin want this Xbox and uh, I was like hell yeah so as a kid so uh, I remember I had a, a friend over um, this kid I used to go to her school with and uh, it was on a, a weekend and we picked it up from her and we went to GameStop my mom was like hey I'll buy you some games for it uh, which I don't have them now, on, on, or fortunately, but or, 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 or one of the games I did have, I do have with me. Um, so anyways, I think I remember we bought like a Hulk game, we bought uh, a Terminator game, which was really fun. Um, bought a Looney Tunes game, which was okay, and then I bought uh, Sonic Heroes, which I played, my first experience with this was originally on the PS2, the most terrible version of the game <laughs> uh, but I eventually did get it on GameCube and I think this was like my last version I bought so I was like oh cool there's, so there's Sonic Heroes I think it was like really affordable back in that time when GameStop sold them so 
Anyways, uh, I think the, the system came with two Duke controllers. Um, eventually, the system was just kind of like left in the dust. This is like way, way before I got into collecting retro games and stuff. Um, so I or sold it one day at a yard sale with all the games. Uh, about a year or two ago, Sean's uh, Xbox or broke down. Um, what happened? Like, did the I think the motherboard went bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, we uh, bought one from. Or, well, I was or looking for Sean to see if I can get him a cheap Xbox hit because people are selling them all the time. Surprisingly, like as of today, like this the system goes for a lot more than what we actually paid for ours. Um, but Sean ended up getting a system from uh, or Cybertron. They just sold in the system. With, without any cables and stuff, he got it pretty cheap, but uh, I had a, a seller that I was originally going to buy for Sean, and uh, the, Sean bought his her system from her Cybertron, so I had to tell the seller, sorry, I'm not going to be able to buy it from him. He's like, I'll sell it to you for for 20 and it comes with like eight games. I was like, heck yeah. All the games were like really like cheap games, though. Like They weren't like that very great of games. Um, so I sold those, and then I got some games from my system. Um, the system's in really good shape, fantastic. I actually, uh, sold the Duke controller so I can get me the S controller. Best Austin. controller to get for it. Austin was basically like, uh, do you want it? And he was, in like, Austin was basically like, uh, duh. <laughs> I mean, 20 bucks, I, I've seen the system go for like $100, or locally. Well Look, 20, bu 20 bucks is 20 bucks. You can't go wrong with 20 bucks. I, yeah, no, like... The, Amen the to system that. Was, the system was a bit dusty, but it works like a charm. I mean, just had to, just to or clean it up a bit, and, and it works great. Uh, so let's see. <laughs> it's just like, oh, don't feel bad, Xbox. I've been called dusty, too. <laughs> uh, oh, one thing I forgot to mention about the Xbox, what I really like, is you can actually put in um, an audio disc, um, and you can... And, Rip the entire disc onto the system's hard drive. Yeah, it That's would allow it, really it would like like allow you to that. use like custom soundtracks and Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball actually allows you to uh, put custom uh, soundtracks oh, onto the game. Oh wow, that's amazing! Yeah, no, like I, I actually was kind of rebellious. I uh, put Persona Three and Persona Four's uh, soundtrack soundtrack disc onto the system. So I have those on there. Um, so I talked about Sonic Heroes. Kind of touched on your Ninja Gaiden. I got that a, a, a while back. Um, I got it pretty cheap. I want to get Ninja Gaiden Black eventually. Let's see, Soul Calibur. Talk about that. Sonic Mega Collection Plus. This game. So, I originally had Sonic Mega Collection on the GameCube a long time ago. I bought it from a, a blockbuster, actually. Um. <laughs> I think this version is a bit more superior because it has more games on it and stuff. Um, what's really cool about the Xbox version, I don't know if this is on the other versions, but... It is on the PS2. I actually have the PS2 version of Mega Collection Plus, actually. Well, no, like, I was I was gonna talk about, like, the extra stuff that's, like, on it. Like, the, uh, there's, like, trailers and stuff. Like, they actually have, uh, the original storyboard for the intro for, for Sonic, uh, um, heroes, and also like the, they also put in the original um, song of or Sonic Heroes before they did all the audio editing with it. So it's really really cool to, to or see all that. Um, definitely love having this in my collection. I I wish the artwork was a bit better, but beggars can't be choosers. But um, got it for a pretty decent price. It's a pretty cheap game. So if you like Sonic. Definitely pick up this game for the Xbox. It's it's really easy to come by. Next Definitely game, more of the, uh, the Mega Collection, right? Oh yeah. Next game I got uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. Very good game. Um, the original Tony Hawk Pro Skater games are just down to earth fun. Um, just to pop in and just uh, kill some time in. Um, I'm 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 really wanting to get the. Uh, Pro Skater or one and two uh, remaster that they did. Yeah, no, I have. I think I got Pro Skater three for my PS one. Um, that was actually that 
Yeah, that was actually the first. That was actually the first uh, version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 that I ever played. The PS1 version. The game soundtrack's so good. I do uh, feel like it was. The, it did have the best soundtrack of the series, no doubt. I got this game pretty cheap, so the the Tony Hawk Pro Skater games are pretty easy to come by. Definitely pick it up if you ever get the chance. Because like what Next I like, game. what I also like about uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 on the Xbox is because like much like uh, Soul Calibur 2. It also supports 720p on an HD TV, so this is another one of those games that utilizes like the high resolution yeah, it of HD. Uh, it actually utilizes actual high definition uh, at, so at cool. the time, and honestly, I feel like out of all the other versions of Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4 that existed during that time, this one is definitely the best one, in, in my opinion. Oh, this is yeah. definitely the best version. And uh, as I already and remember how I said that you can also add custom soundtracks in Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball, you can actually do the same thing in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 on the yeah, original I Xbox. Do that. Oh, I gotta do that then. Yeah, you can play, actually uh, add custom soundtracks. That's play. also the best part. Oh, I gotta play that after our call. It's so <laughs> cool. Yeah, because like, I got music I got on the system, I just heard never used it. Uh, are you gonna play Tony Hawk? Are you gonna play Tony Hawk to Persona music? Oh, hell yeah. Any day. Uh, next game I got is the Mega Man Anniversary Collection. Uh, this has a bunch of games on it. I think, yeah, it has like 10 games. Um, it has Mega Man 8 on it. Yeah. It's got 10 classic Mega Man titles. Um, probably some artwork and stuff too, if I remember the couple times I've played it. Yeah. Uh, I haven't got a chance to get into Mega Man yet. It's actually kind of on my backlog. Um, I suggest doing it now because Mega Man is one of my favorite games ever. Mega Man 2 especially. Like, if there's any reason I would want to have that game in my collection <laughs> is so I can uh, play Mega Man 2 again because I've actually managed to beat it twice. It's easily, like, one of the best uh, platforming games ever made and one of my favorite games on NES. And no doubt that collection is uh, definitely a good way to access it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, my experience with Mega Man prior to this has to be the Mega Man Battle Network games on the Game Boy Advance. Um, I played the fourth and fifth games. I remember I got to like the end of like, I think the, no, it was the fifth and sixth game. I'm sorry. I got to the end of like the fifth game and I just couldn't beat it because it was so hard. That's uh, not the hour. Oh yeah, no, they were, yeah, they got stupid hard. Uh, That's but I, I, I used to, shut up. I used to own both of them. <laughs> I know where you live, Sean. <laughs> uh, <laughs> look, I do that. Look, I do. I make these kind of jokes in our retro video videos. I have to do it here. That's true. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm very happy to have this in my library. Uh, last game I got, last but not least. Guilty ah, Gear Guilty X2. Gear X2. I actually Easily. have that on Steam. Easily considered the best 2D uh, fighter on the Xbox. Oh my god, this game is so much fun. I got it on PS2, actually, right, Sean? Yeah. Yeah, we both yeah. have... Uh, I gotta get a case for it still, but I got the disc on PS2. I think, I think, Re I think Reload actually got a release on PS2 in Europe. Huh. Yeah. I can always or burn the game and or play it on my PS2. <laughs> yep. Also, uh, another game that I have, which let me grab it real quick. There's another game that I forgot that I had played, that we've all played, actually. Oh, uh, yeah? Back when the Xbox was relevant. Oh, oh yeah. yes! Oh, Marvel yeah. vs. Yeah. Capcom 2. Yes. You see, in this, in this game's interesting. Because the first I played Marvel vs. Capcom 1, the first, time I, the first time I played Marvel vs. Capcom 1 was in the arcades. And then I found out I was on a Dreamcast. I had I knew that Marvel vs. Capcom 2 was on Dreamcast, but this was the first time I had played Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Your nice. very first one was the uh, Xbox version. Yeah, and unfortunately, as some of you know, this game has slowed down, much like the PS2 version, and the graphics are a bit more compressed. Right. Than the other version. So it's still I, a, it's still a all time classic though. Still an all time classic, and uh, one of the games that's considered probably not one of the best fighting games on the original Xbox. 
Yeah, SVC SNK versus Capcom SVC Chaos. It's funny. It's huh. like I've never seen that game before. It's funny because um, even though even though the game is criticized for having outdated graphics because it looks because you know it was released on the uh, the A the Neo Geo AES, which was a you know a, basically like a dinosaur of an arcade machine uh, by today's standards, but. Uh, from a gameplay standpoint, like much like Marvel vs. Capcom 2, it's a it's a very unbalanced fighter. Uh, but it, you know, from a gameplay standpoint, it's 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 still pretty playable. Uh, but what makes Marvel vs. Capcom 2 superior to SVC Chaos is the amount of fan service and the character roster is definitely much higher. And SVC Chaos, which uh, came out two years after uh, the success that was Capcom vs. SNK 2. It was definitely not held in high regard. In fact, many people considered it a massive disappointment for what was supposed to be SNK's take on the whole SNK versus Capcom craze, which was going on at the time. Right. right. When I when I first played the first time I saw this game, actually, was in the arcades. When I when I actually went to visit Florida, which is where I live now, with my family for Christmas, is I saw this in an arcade. I think in Universal, actually. Really? Oh, really? Yeah, I saw the official arcade machine, and I was like, Hold on a minute, I've seen that game in Xbox Magazine! Maybe I should play it! And my dad was like, No, you won't! And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did that actually happen? I, want, I was like, hey dad, can I play it? And he was like, no. And I'm like, alright. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's like... No. Damn. But like, yeah, I didn't end up playing... I actually ended up playing it on a uh, Neo Geo emulator. Wow, interesting. And you know what? I said to myself after that, "You're gonna buy this good, game." No, it's a good thing I didn't spend my uh, dad's money on this game because it's shit. <laughs> 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 but of course, I ended up buying it because I have issues. But well, you're um, a collector, so. <laughs> hey, we all have issues. Or welcome to the club. Welcome to the Virtual Vaders, where we have issues. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, do I glad I have these two here, am I right? <laughs> Thanks, Larry. We appreciate it. Thanks, <laughs> but remember, this was your idea. Wait, wait. Hey, I, I was the one who said this, so I, I guess I'm the big cheese here. Feel free to blame me in the comments, y'all. <laughs> All right, Larry. It's it's your turn. Oh, boy. Where do I start with this one? This This one's actually kind of interesting. So my history with the uh, with the original Xbox goes back to I would say 2004 at the earliest I can say because uh, because my maternal cousin who also had an N64 which is how I found out that that thing even exists uh, he also had an original Xbox because you know he's a huge Xbox fan so uh, at the time you know I was mostly the PlayStation guy my parents were always like. Uh, exposed me to the PlayStation 1 and the PS2, which you can probably see behind my Dorito bag. Sorry, that's there. But yeah, you can see that my PS1 <laughs> and my, my PS1 is sitting right on top of my PS2 fat. So th those were the two that defined my childhood. However, when I saw Xbox, I think my perception had changed completely. So, um, I remember my cousin, my maternal cousin at least, and my paternal cousin would both, like, hang out with each other from time to time. Um, you know, my maternal cousin would have his, uh, you know, original Xbox around. Uh, he had games like, uh, Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition, which I actually own on, uh, the PlayStation 2. And it's actually, uh, my favorite racing game on the PlayStation 2 because I've, that was the one I've invested the most hours on. But, uh, but what also, what made me interested though was like when I first saw this system fight, like, first off, I thought it was really huge. That was the first thing. Secondly, I was like, oh my gosh, this actually looks really good as shit. Like, it's, like, the display is so clear. And one of the first few games that I saw my maternal cousin play, which I don't currently own, but I'm very, I'm very familiar with it, and it was made by one of my favorite game companies, Midway. They were known for making a franchise known as NFL Blitz, and one of the few games I've, I remember him specifically playing on the original Xbox was Blitz the League. It was a, it was, I, by far, I think it's the first and only football game to be rated M because it was, oh my gosh. Like, I can't even, I can't even tell you how it was seeing that, as a, seeing that game as a kid. Um, it, it, it's pretty effed up. I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Like, it, it is a football game, but 
there's like a lot of shit that goes on in it and it's just oh my god oh my god like b- imagine being five years old and see a game like this insanely violent over the top and provocative and whatnot i mean this game oh. easily put dead or alive to shame oh oh i can't oh i can't imagine because <laughs> i experienced mortal kombat trilogy on nintendo 64 that game scared out of me <laughs> <laughs> but um but as far as the original xbox goes um that was literally like the only time I, i've only really played it only once and the, the at least at the time when i was a kid and the first one that the first game i had ever played on the original xbox which i wish i had the version of it was actually midnight club 3 dub edition but again i played the ps2 version more so that one kind of had more nostalgia but I, no doubt about it. That game, which is my favorite racing game on the PS2, was what exposed me to the world of Xbox. And as far as uh, mi- as far as many of these games go, li- a lot of which we pretty much already spoke about, but there's one in particular that I wanted to discuss, and that is Doom 3. I remember Damn. distinctly when I first got into uh, collecting systems you know, collecting systems, and when I got the, you know, original Xbox, one of the first games I wanted to make sure I had in my collection was Doom 3, because first off, it's Doom is my favorite first-person shooter game franchise, and Doom 3, uh, much like many of these other games on here, is one of those games where it, it helps uh, show how powerful the Xbox was, because... You know, Doom, remember, Doom, when Doom came out um, originally, which was like on many platforms during that time, Atari Jaguar, PlayStation 1, Sega Saturn, all that, at the time when the first Doom game came out, there really wasn't any that much uh, great home console versions of Doom at the time, you know what I mean? Because a lot of them either had like very uh, crappy frame rate or controls were very unresponsive. The only few good versions of Doom, of home versions of Doom that existed at the time, was the Atari Jaguar version and the PlayStation 1 version. The PlayStation 1 version was actually regarded as the best one at the time. And even then, you know, the frame rate would like drop from time to time, which kind of hurt, which kind of hurt the uh, performance of the game. So when Doom 3 came out, what id Software wanted to do was that they wanted to port their newest Doom game on a home console that would essentially be the most powerful one based on PC hardware since that's where Doom made the most notoriety since the Windows 95 days. So uh, there were many other games at the time that, uh, I know Star Wars The Old Night Republic, I believe, I think that's the name of the game, was um, was one of the many games that was ported to the Xbox specifically to showcase the power. But when id Software did Doom 3, they did exactly that, because not only was Doom 3 released on PC, but it was also released on the uh, Xbox as well. To top it all off, not only does this game have online play, but you can also communicate with people online through uh, the communicator headset, which again, using a headset to communicate at the time was such a big deal. And it now also it's like supported, so normal. <laughs> yeah. And, and, that, and not only that, but it was also one of the earliest games to support DLC because as some of you probably know, Doom 3 did have expansion packs, most famously Resurrection of Evil. And what? And another thing, and, and this also kind of ties in to something I wanted to add about why Xbox Live was so important, especially you know since I've also seen it. Uh, the, I've seen this as a kid too, growing up. Like I remember, even though I tried, you know, connecting to the internet with my PS2, when I first saw Xbox Live on the original Xbox, it, it blew me away because it it was literally the seed. To what would become what would become the the standpoint of what of how online gaming is now, because Xbox Live at the time was literally the most online friendly uh, gaming service at the time. Because with, I mean, you know, much like the PlayStation 2, you still had to use you still had to plug it up manually through like the Ethernet cable. But what set it apart from you know PS2 and other systems at the time was that Xbox Live included almost everything like. They had add-ons, DLC, they had game demos, they even had an Xbox Live Arcade where you could like download like all kinds of like old games and stuff like that. But the center point for what how online gaming is now was DLC and Doom 3 was one of the first few games to really set that mark. And in a way, 
the original Xbox, uh, having the original, uh, having, you know, Xbox Live, uh, a lot of game consoles nowadays, PlayStation included, technically have to owe themselves to Xbox Live. If I'm being, yeah. I don't think PlayStation Network would be a thing if Xbox Live was never around. Hell, I don't even think that the Nintendo Network would even be around if it wasn't for Xbox it's Live. A the Nintendo Network would certainly not be around. If, it, not for the, uh, if not for Xbox, it, 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 it really would. And, it. And, <laughs> and as we said before, it all go, it all dates back to you know the Sega days when you know Sega Dreamcast trying to do online gaming and Microsoft and because Microsoft and Sega were working together, they helped perfect it this crap. And what they did was something that went above and beyond, which is yeah. why which is why me and I'm sure the, the both of you as well would consider the Xbox to be the reincarnation of the Dreamcast. I've had some. I've had someone try to convince me that the Xbox, that the Dreamcast, shouldn't get as much credit as it does for online gaming, and I'm like, yo, you don't know what I'm talking about. The thing is, is that I think, I th I truly do think that this console is more important than most people probably remember, specifically for that reason. And one game in particular that should definitely get credit, even if you can either love it, you can you can hate it. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be your favorite. But it's safe to say that without this particular game, the Xbox wouldn't have as much notoriety as it does today, since it's regarded as one of the most important games of all time. And that is yep. Halo 2. Now, uh, you know, the only unfortunate That's the part here, in the room for Xbox. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm pretty sure someone was waiting for me to address this with people uh, pretty much calling this game the definitive best Xbox game. And to top it all off, it is the best selling original. Uh, I got a good today. story about Halo 2, actually. Do you mind if I say it real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the one thing about Xbox that I really love about it is land play. Land play was done really, really well on, on the Xbox. Um, the game I actually got to experience land play with, this is actually probably the first game I've ever done it with, Halo 2. Oh, wow. Halo 1 and, and Halo 2, actually. I remember, like, I used to be in a church youth group, and, like, we had, like, a boys' night out or something like that. And uh, I remember we had, like, four, uh, like, or roll-up uh, screens, and we got projectors for them. And I think we did, like, two or three X or four Xboxes or, or something like that. How many s systems could you do uh, or, or, or land play with, too? Land play for, for Halo 2? It would yeah. it would link up to sixteen at a time, two to sixteen. Okay, I think we did like four systems, and uh, I remember like we all like just had a blast, like this dicking around inside of uh, <laughs> cool. Halo or one and two. Oh my god, dude! Had like all the lights off, and like we had like like a a modem to like hook up all of our systems. Oh, it was a blast. That game is just. It's there's so much fun, man. It, it, it is the multiplayer. I can say that that the multiplayer. I've actually, I'm actually a, for, I'm actually fortunate enough to have played a couple of uh, online matches on uh, Halo 2. Not just, not on the PC. No, I, I did this on the original Xbox. Actually, and you might be wondering, well, the Xbox Live got discontinued in 2010, so how'd you do it? Well, the thing is, is that despite the Xbox Live servers being cut from the original Xbox completely. Uh, much like the PS2, is still being supported to this day with using third-party servers. And what you have to do is that you have to plug your Ethernet up to your computer, and then you have to like download a specific software so that you can have the console connect to those servers. And I can safely say with an open heart that the uh, that the servers on here. I did this like a couple years ago. The, they they were actually they were actually fun. I sucked. But it was, it, it it was hella fun. Like I was actually really surprised at how much I enjoyed it. And if there was anything that I've learned from that moment too, is that despite the Xbox 360, the one, and even more recently the Xbox Series X being around, nobody is gonna let the original Xbox die off the face of the planet completely. If anything, Microsoft definitely doesn't want to abandon it either, because. They're literally making it so where that not only the Xbox, they're making it so where the Xbox One and the series. I'm not sure. I'm not too sure about the series right now because I don't really have one. I haven't looked up in the news recently, so I don't want to spread any misinformation. But I do know that the Xbox One was uh, backwards compatible with the original Xbox and the 360. So the fact that Microsoft is holding on to their 
older hardware in more high regards more so than Sony is with the PlayStation just says a lot about how mu how much right. of an impact and the legacy that the Xbox brand has had on the gaming industry. But beyond that, that's everything I have to say. I want to thank both of you for taking time out of your busy days to come here and talk about the Microsoft Xbox to celebrate its 20th anniversary. Because I truly believe that, in my own honest opinion, that the original Xbox is one of the greatest game consoles ever made. And my argument for that being is that uh, it took Xbox Live to a whole new level. It was groundbreaking for its time. And not to, not only just for online gaming, but just for... Um, j just for just for graph just for technological reasons as well but the reason why it failed was it wasn't so much of the fact that the ps2 kind of stole it, even though the ps2 technically did stole all this glory like it did with the dreamcast but one of the main reasons why the xbox got discontinued in the first place was not only because the xbox 360 came out in the middle of its lifespan but because the original xbox was more expensive to make because you got to keep in mind, unlike the unlike the PS2, which had a, a smaller, cheaper model to make, which was the PS2 Slim, the original Xbox never had a Slim model. The Xbox 360 did. So what happened was that they would continuously re release new games for the original Xbox all the way up to 2009, with its final game being Madden NFL 2009 being released as late as 2008 and that would be the original xbox's final game and then in 2010 yeah, i didn't know wait yeah and then and then in 2000 <laughs> and then in two, and then in 2010 the original microsoft shut off the original xbox's uh, xbox live servers and the console was officially put to rest but i think this console should definitely be respected not only more by myself but to anyone who loves video games as well because of how many standards the Xbox has achieved and many of the first that it has. It truly is the reincarnated Sega Dreamcast. It is. It really is. Yep. Like that, people have been asking, when Dreamcast 2? And I'm just like, dude, we already got the Dreamcast 2 with the Xbox. It, I know, right? It already, <laughs> it already happened. But thank so, you guys for watching. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button. So that way you guys and hit the notification bell and I will also leave a link to the Retro Raiders channels below because they've recently made <laughs> they've recently uh, made a video. Actually, they just uploaded a video from a video that was filmed during the summer that uh, documented uh, Dark Vice's birthday. So I'm going to make sure that I leave them in the description below. Make sure you guys subscribe to them because they make some very Thank excellent retro, uh, retrospective videos. By all means, guys, we definitely got to do another review sometime. We definitely got to do uh, another uh, one. We, we have Hell yeah, I'm we down. We have something that we wish to announce. Please, we by do. all means, announce it. I will, we would will love to hear it. But a teaser for the next Retro Raiders episode. Oh, yeah. The next console... Uh, the next console will cover one. Uh, just gonna say, it does what Nintendo don't. That's all I'm gonna leave Ooh. it at. <laughs> oh, I am so making a reaction to that. I'm so making a reaction video to that. Expect that. <laughs> I'm already, me and him have been this for a while. I yep. cannot yeah, wait. No, I it, cannot it, wait. For it's this actually one. been in the, in the talks for a while, so. Um, we're, we're gonna make it really soon. I wish you both nothing but the best of luck towards that. Yeah, I, I will definitely be Thank the you. first one. I'll definitely be the first one to see. As long as I'm not in captivity from my job, I will definitely be the first one to see it. I'll give you got or I'll give you a special premiere link. Hey, there we go. There we go. So take care, everyone. This is your friendly neighborhood reptiles on the Shizzle Network. Signing go. I think he just had an aneurysm. <laughs> I did. I definitely did. <laughs>